All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We thank you for this day and this time uh, to come together to discuss these amazing and important teachings um, by St. John Paul II. We ask you, Lord, to be with us as we as we dive into Theology of the Body number nine. Help us to understand more fully um, the meaning of our bodies and the way that God created us um, male and female from the beginning. Uh, please, please give us light and your Holy Spirit to guide this conversation. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the intercession of our Blessed Mother, we ask her to pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Lord is with thee. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. St. John Paul II, Pray for, pray, for pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I share my screen, and we will get started. Okay, so we are in these Theology of the Body discussions going one by one through the audiences of John Paul II, which he delivered um, from Rome on a General Wednesday audiences um, from 1979 to 1984. And these were the, during the first five years of his pontificate. Um, you can still follow Wednesday audiences from the Pope. Pope Francis is currently doing a series right now um, entitled Healing the World um, every Wednesday. So the Wednesday audiences are, are still going on and they're amazing uh, way for the Pope to teach the universal church. So these happened all the way back in 1979 and the, the audience we're gonna be discussing today, um, John Paul delivered November 14th, 1979. We're in the section of theology of the body called original man. Um, when Jesus refers to the beginning and is discussing our origin, uh, John Paul II reflects on the book of Genesis, uh, and we've talked about original solitude, how Adam discovered he was different from all the animals, that humanity is uh, set apart, is different than creation because of his uh, soul, because of his rationality and free will, and his personhood, his personal dignity. Um, so we're going to go now the next section of original man of reflecting on God's plan in the beginning um, is called original unity. So we, we move from original solitude to original unity at the creation of woman as when Adam is made, goes into the sleep and is made, wakes up as male and female. So their unity denotes above all the identity of human nature. Duality, on the other hand, shows that on the basis of this identity, has the masculinity and femininity of created man. So this image back behind this quote is the creation of Eve. You see God the Father on the right, sort of drawing Eve from the side of Adam as he sleeps, um, forming Eve from the rib of Adam. And we talked about last time, this rib denotes equality in uh, human identity, equality in human nature. So there's a human dignity where the male and female are equal. However, as we will see, masculinity and femininity are different in the fact that they're complementary. And this complementarity of masculinity and femininity allows for life to be, to come forth from their unity. So when we speak of original unity, first of all, John Paul II says it means a unity in human nature. So they're both human. They're both fully human. And this is their unity. Their duality, on the other hand, shows 
that in this one human nature, they are constituted as masculine and feminine. Um, so there's two different ways of being human. Our culture today and our modern world right now is uh, confused sometimes about um, gender and they're trying to say there's many different different types of uh, gender and sexuality, but we see from the beginning that God created only two, masculine and feminine. And uh, these two together in their complementarity bring forth life. Only the masculine and feminine together in marriage will bring forth a new life of a new child. So this is a quote from Vatican II. When John Paul II speaks about the communion of persons, this is the first time he brings up this phrase, communion of persons, and it's from Gaudium et Spes uh, from Vatican II. But God did not create man, abandoning him alone. For from the beginning, male and female, he created them. And their union constitutes the first form of the communion of persons. Uh, this is uh, rooted in church teaching. This is from Vatican II. Communio says more and with greater precision because it indicates precisely the help that derives in some way from the very fact of existing as a person beside a person. So John Paul II has a, um, a reflection in Theology of the Body, audience number nine, section two, he starts to speak of this communio uh, that man and woman form from the beginning. Uh, and he says that a this is reflecting on the phrase that God saw is not good that man will be alone, but he will make a help sim uh, similar to him. To help. So with this help, um, John Paul II says it's a person beside a person or a person living for a person. Uh, so this just shows that man and woman are created for each other to be a gift for one another. And this is really a key aspect of theology of the body in this section. Um, it's really amazing what John Paul II uh, elucidated or what he teaches here um, about the image of God. So we, our whole Catholic tradition has seen the image of God uh, being in man um, and woman as them having reason and free will. And this is what makes the image, this is what puts them in the image of God, because God is a person, a divine person that rules the world. Um, and man and woman are created in his image with, as, as a person too, as having uh, reason and free will, just like God. Um, however, John Paul II says man became, and this is also just from scripture, man became the image of God, not only through his own humanity, but also through the communion of persons. Man becomes an image of God, not so much in the moment of solitude as in the moment of communion. So this is the Trinitarian aspect of the image of God, that we know that scripture reveals, Jesus reveals, when God became man, Jesus fully revealed, um, you know, he, he revealed the Trinity. So he revealed that God is three uh, persons in one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Catechism teaches um, that this Trinity is a eternal exchange of love that these three people of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from all eternity, they have been in a relationship of perfect love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that when God creates male and female, he creates them as in the image of God, that their male and female are called to image God, not by simply being a person by themselves, a solitary figure, but more so in the moment of their communion of love with other persons. So as human beings, male and female, in a family, in society, as we form this communion of persons in love, we're being an image of the Blessed Trinity, who is a communion of persons. So 
So Adam sees Eve, he wakes from his sleep and he cries out flesh from my flesh and bone from my bones. So at this first sight of woman, he, he exclaims with joy that at last there's someone that's flesh from my flesh and bones from my bones, someone I can enter into a relationship with. The man speaks these words as if it were only at the sight of woman that he could identify and call by name that which makes them in, the visible, in a visible way similar, the one to the other, and at the same time, that in which humanity is manifested. So God had brought all the animals to Adam to name, but as he named him, as Adam named all the animals, he saw that he was not like any of them, that he could not really enter into a personal relationship with any of them. However, when he wakes up from sleep and he sees the body of Eve, he sees what's visible in her, he says, yes, this is another human. This is another person with which I can enter into a relationship with. So it's the body of Eve, the body of Adam, that reveal the personal nature of them, that, they, that they're human persons. The unity that is realized through the body indicates from the beginning, not only the body, but also the incarnate communion of persons, communio personarum. So Adam and Eve are called to this union of the body. In marriage, the husband and wife give each other, give themselves to each other in the body, in the flesh. However, this body union, this union of the body is actually a communion of persons because we are our body. There's a body soul unity. So when a human person gives themselves in the body, they are giving themselves as a person because you can't separate the soul and the body. Um, there's no duality there. So when, when a human body gives him or herself, they're giving their entire person. They're giving their entire self. Masculinity and femininity express the twofold aspect of man's somatic constitution. This time she is flesh from my flesh and bone from my bones. So there's two, two ways of being a body. Somatic means body. Somatic constitution. So bodily, how their body, masculinity and femininity, are two ways of being a body, being human, and indicate in addition through the same words of Genesis 2.23, the new consciousness of the meaning of one's own body. This meaning, one could say, consists in reciprocal enrichment. So we saw through this whole time that Genesis 2 reveals uh, this experience, this original experience of Adam and Eve. And in this experience, Adam and Eve are becoming aware, self-aware of the meaning of their own bodies. So we, they discovered in original solitude a meaning of their body. Um, and now in their original unity, they're discovering the meaning of their body and that this body consists in reciprocal enrichment. This meaning consists in reciprocal enrichment. So they're realizing that the meaning of their body is actually to be a gift, to mutually enrich another person, uh, to enter into a relationship with another. They see this as the meaning of their body. Okay, so our next discussion will be on Theology of the Body number 10. Uh, and it's the title that John Paul II gave, The Unity of Becoming One Flesh. All right, so uh, hi everybody. I would like to open it up to discussion. Um, are there any thoughts from this audience um, that you'd like to, to share or any insights that you have or any questions you wanna bring up to the group? And I, I just ask that we, we respectfully dialogue and we uh, seek the truth together. I really like um, 
how it says we are the image of God through other people. Well, that's what I took. Yeah, by entering into that relationship with others, mm -hmm. um, by by loving other people, when we when we're in a relationship of love, then mm -hmm. then we're in the image of God. Hi, Pai. Hi, Delia. Hi, Geronimo. Welcome. <laughs> so, anybody have any thoughts on this? this one? Well, what, what calls my attention pretty much is this term. I don't remember how you said it in English. In Spanish, I have it as Enriquecimiento recíproco, which is mutual, mutual enrichment, I think, yes. And that, I mean, I think that term is going to help us a lot because it, it helps us see the dignity in both of them. Is, is, is it okay? Can you listen? <laughs> Sorry, because there's a lot of noise here. Um, that we're different, but we are complementary. And this mutual enrichment, I think, is the answer to what many times in this world we're looking for, right? We speak about if both of them have the same dignity or maybe women need, they have to defend their rights or whatever, but it's not, we're not up in opposition, but in this mutual enrichment, which is I think something that can enlighten us a lot, no? knowing that our differences actually make us more um, enriching to the other. So it's, some it's something that, that is okay. I mean, it, it's like setting aside this fight, trying to be the same as the other sex, which is useless. We don't need to be the same. It's okay to be different. And that's what makes us complementary. But it's important that we're different too, because the, the other draws something out of us that uh, wouldn't be drawn out of us otherwise. Uh, you know, us males like to bond, but all that does is reinforce, you know, certain things. The femininity and the masculinity um, interacting or entwined uh, becomes, I think, revelatory to both in terms of uh, we're out of the other person just because of our differences. Experienced maybe initially in terms of frustration or stuff like that, but in working things out, a greater good always comes. The other thing that, and I think in watching Bill's thing too, uh, Donahue, um, all the different uh, expressions of gender that our culture is offering us. Mm -hmm. They don't offer anything that, that draws you out of yourself into a, a wider view, a, a wider uh, expression or, or going outside of yourself and, and also in, in a, a fruitfulness. And that's what seems to be lacking in all of the, uh, the different uh, types of uh, gender expressions that we're told that uh, mm -hmm. importance in our culture, which is sad. Yeah. Yes, I think that following what you just said, Ed, I think that's something important that, that explains what we're trying to understand now, that the world has taught us that we need to find our own fulfillment. And I think theology of the body is one of the only teachings that I know that speaks to us about opening ourselves to other, to another person. So this complementarity speaks to us about that we actually need someone different than us. 
than ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, that, but, and that we need to come out of ourselves in order to give and receive. And I think that's very different from, from what we hear every day and maybe what, what is distinct of theology of the body. Well, in, in our culture almost tells us we're supposed to deny those things that are unique about ourselves. Mm -hmm. In many ways, they've flattened us. You know, men and women are the same in, in, in terms of what they're trying to tell us in terms of achievement and goal and everything. But uh, the difference is, is just, I think, uh, creates a fuller humanity. Yeah, I think um, I'm just thinking of the workplace, like um, with women's role, like women's ability to enter the workforce and to work in jobs. Like, I think women, like John Paul II speaks of the feminine genius that in uh, Mulieris Dignitatum, the dignity of women in his document, um, that women have a particular genius that they should bring to society like they should bring that gift of the feminine to all aspects of society just like the mass males should bring the masculine traits to society as well um, in the workplace however that does not mean that women should try to be like men in the sense of uh, to look like men, to act like men, like women should be fully feminine in beauty, expressing beauty, expressing the feminine traits. Um, like I, in the business world, I'm personally, this is just a personal opinion of myself. Like I'm not a fan of women dressing and looking exactly like men. I think women should bring that feminine quality to those places um, yeah, I don't know. That's just a personal <laughs> thing. Well, and, and I think as, as, uh, males, it's so important for us, uh, to look to Mary as, and well, for everybody to look to Mary, but her receptivity, which isn't, uh, natural, I think as, as natural for men. And yet it, it's, uh, only in receptivity that we accept faith and uh, turn our will over to God. Yeah, Mary, Mary is the perfect um, model or example of femininity of being open to the will of God. Um, to being open to the word of God expressed to her and, and she's saying yes. And then St. Joseph is an excellent model for men. He, mm -hmm. he, in the scriptures, he's silent, but he does the will of God. Like God comes to him in a dream in, in the night and expresses God's will. And Joseph just does it. He just wakes up. Okay, let's do this. Um, and yeah, so they're, they're both great models of masculinity and femininity. I feel like in this culture, we take things um, kind of to, to extremes. Um, uh, Nick, and you mentioned, you know, like how women tend to end up dressing a lot like men in the workplace. And um, I agree with that. It's, it's, I don't really, I don't find that appealing myself. And I think part of it is because a lot of women in the workplace want to compete with the men. So, you know, they kind of want to be on that equal footing with men and not want to be, you know, kind of pushed down by in the corporate world, you know, like men get the, the races or whatnot, and they get, you know, they have more power, so to speak. And, you know, that's always been, you know, the work, you know, men go to work, women stay at home. And 
in my opinion, that's, you know, how it should be, but that's my opinion. And, you know, um, so uh, instead of the women continuing to be the, you know, women and bringing that, the, the female genius that, you know, um, John Paul talks about, they we've taken it to the extreme of like women are equal to men like we're the same mm -hmm. and there's no um like the balance is gone it's like we, we go to these extremes we can't keep that balance of we are male and female and the male brings this part and the female brings this part it's like now it's like the males want to become i mean the females want to become just like men and we've lost that sense of balance between male and female in this culture and um yeah, it's pretty sad but um i just uh this is you know something i wanted to add to the discussion <laughs> uh, and i would agree and say that the, the whole push of toxic masculinity in some ways is a way to uh, push down males from expressing their maleness in some ways not that uh, there isn't some uh, expression of masculinity is out of line now, but uh, mm -hmm. I think it's it's again trying to flatten out both genders. Right. I think as a result too, um, males have resorted to the the whole you know homosexual movement and all that. It, I think everything just it, it just all like um, what's the word I'm looking for? It just it, it just like a, a waterfall, you know, so to speak. I can't think of the word, the right word. My, my husband were here, he'd tell me the right word, but um, it, it just cas cascaded down, you know, like, you know, the whole women's movement came and then now the males are like trying to be females and the women are trying to be males. And there's this whole confusion going on where like the males are trying to, do stuff with males and the, you know, I mean, I know it started all, it's been going back, you know, from Genesis, you know, and all that stuff, but it's just gone, you know, we've seen to have gone back to that, you know, like way, you know, it's going back and now, you know, with the whole pedophilia stuff going on and, you know, it's just, it's, we just can't seem to, you know, we go to extremes, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. that's just our sinful nature and we can't, you know, we, seem, we can't seem to help it. And um, theology of the body is such a, a wonderful reminder, you know, just going back to the basics, going back to the beginning and how um, God made us male and female and the, the masculinity and femininity of created men. Um, and there's a few things here that I, I would just love to um, pick at and I, I'll look at them you know, when you guys talk. I get concerned when these discussions tend to become very stereotypical. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I love Mary, but she is but one of the women in the Old and New Testament. There are others that are very different in characteristics, mm -hmm. like Mary Magdalene, like uh, Deborah, like Ruth, like Lydia. Uh, and in modern times, St. Teresa challenged the authority of males in what she was doing as a very strong woman with arguably what, we, what some people stereotypically would call masculine traits or the masculine traits of Joan of Arc. These are, there is a spectrum of masculinity and femininity in the human person and to stereotype them or force them into, you know, you're a woman, you need to be like Mary and not like somebody else is, is very wrong. And I think Christians and Catholics get into that. It's, it's not because of what they believe, it's because of what they're trying to argue, which gets them all in, into causing people to be very upset with the self-righteousness of Christianity and Catholicism if we're not careful. The only, the only counter that I would have a little bit with Nick on that is when we're uh, to use Mary as a model, that doesn't mean we take every little trait about her. 
but her receptivity, we all can gain from that kind of receptivity to God, that uh, immediate fiat that she gave and such. And the fact that every moment of her life, you know, I, I, abandonment of divine providence by um, De Cus yeah, same. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, he, yeah. Yeah, he, he talks about and, and that too, but I mean, um, they did the most mundane things, but they did it totally for God. And so in that respect, I think we can take things out of it. And, and it, any woman or, or male could learn from that. Obviously, you, what you mentioned is the different personalities within the Bible. And there, that richness, I agree with you. I agree with you 100 percent that we can learn from the the various women and men. But uh, Mary's special place, I think, exists because of the uh, ultimate receptivity that she showed, and the fruition of that was bringing in the Christ child. Yeah, I, I think like men and women can learn from Mary. So like we, like Ed, you just said, like the receptivity of Mary, like men and women of all times and places are called the, that openness to God's will. And just like St. Joseph, men and women are called to act on, on the will of God when it's made known to them. Um, but I do think men and women need role models of their same gender uh, to follow. And I think, I think Nick, you mentioned a lot of really great ones that are in the Bible, um, you know, uh, all of the Old Testament and, and New Testament. There's many great role models. All of the saints throughout the ages of the church um, are great role models. And I think there's something special about a male figure being a role model for a man, like that there's something, you know, we can learn from both. I think we can learn from women. Like Mary can be my role model too, as a man. To be, I want to be like her, but there's a special way that, um, like I'm thinking of religious sisters, that they try to model their life off of Mary in a particular way. Um, and I think, yeah, so I think there's a certain goodness about women having role models who are women and men having role models who are men. I think it's not only... I... Oh, no, sorry, Nick? Yeah. Ah, go ahead. Hi, Maurice. Understood. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, Julia. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I definitely agree with Nick, you know, just having... Um, Saints as a role model. I mean, like, yeah, I've already told you guys about, you know, my gender issues. And um, because of that, um, when I pray, sometimes I always pray to St. Joseph, you know, he's a role model for me, just how to be a man. Uh, what is, how do you say it? Like, the true masculinity and but at the same time, I also view Mary as my role model in, in a way like that, because like there's just some aspect from those two that um, can help me dealing with this, you know, issues like St. Joseph being my role model as um, someone who is being uh, masculine and Mary is someone who is being like that loving, gentle, you know, person. And it's just like we need uh, we need to kind of ask back in our life, I guess, like masculinity and femininity. But yeah, it works in kind of different way. I don't know. And Nick, not to completely disagree with you, but to, to just maybe uh, refine our thought in it. When we talk about how uh, a woman draws something on a man that's different than what another male could. 
Um, you know, I, I used to think it was so weird. And for some of you, this might not even be something you're familiar with because it's kind of gone out of favor f with most religious orders. But so many of the religious orders, uh, a male would have Mary as a part of their name or a uh, religious sister would have a, a, a male uh, name in a part of their name. And I, I think that was the idea that the complementarity still is something that's gonna draw from you. A strong image of somebody of the same gender is extremely important, but the complementarity needs to be there. And I think especially with those who have chosen a, a single vocation that uh, to have a, a, a model that is of the opposite, uh, opposite gender uh, adds a complementarity that wouldn't, would be lacking possibly by not being married. Yeah, that's true. I have a friend who became a, um, a sister and in their order today, it's a modern <laughs> religious order. So they still do this of a male saint and a female saint. So she's Sister John Mary. So she has John Paul II, that's the John, and then Mary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's both masculine. That's great, I never thought about that. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah, I, li I like the whole idea of like, just the Holy Family in general, just because, mm -hmm. um, first of all, it obviously reflects the, the Trinity on earth, right? Um, and, um, you know, Mary being the role model um, for me, but I recently also did a, a consecration to St. Joseph with um, Father Calloway, mm -hmm. and um, and it was really powerful for me, and uh, St. Joseph obviously is male, right, and I'm a female, but there's so many qualities in um, St. Joseph that I missed in my life, you know, and, and you know, him being in the background, and um, never really paid attention. It was always all for me. My life has been all about Mary and Mary and Mary. And I never noticed Joseph. He's always in the background because like, you know, um, Nicholas said, it's like, he never really spoke much, you know, but he got to name Jesus and he spent a lot of time with Jesus and he taught Jesus what to do. And he taught Jesus carpentry and, you know, all these things, like all the mannerisms that Jesus had and all these things, you know, he, he got a lot from his parents, mm -hmm. you know, especially Joseph, because he spent a lot, you know, that in the Jewish culture and a lot of the boys spent a lot of times with, you know, with their, with their fathers. And um, so to me that, you know, it was just putting, you know, this whole conversation with the male and female and seeing Mary and Joseph as a husband and wife, you know, in a chaste marriage, um, and the whole balance that they had was just in, in reading the book and all that was just uh, just very, um, very special to me um, to the point. I mean, it was just like, I, I got this canvas and I have to show it to you guys because it, to me, it was just like, it, it shows Mary. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it. It's probably gonna be backwards, but this is Mary here, obviously. And um, she's standing on the serpent. Um, and then you see Joseph, and he's he's he looks very masculine, right? And he's holding the the axe, and he he's like, "Yeah, I got you, Mary." You know, like he he like kills the snake that she's on, and he's just looking at her with you know such love and reverence, and he's mm -hmm. he's got her, you know, I got you, I got your back, you know, and he's with her. And, and this, I, I got this canvas, it's, it's an original, you know, that Father Calloway had, had asked someone from Malta um, commission. And um, it just, to me, it just represents like the whole um, Holy Family, Trinitarian, reciprocal love that they had for each other. Um, and it was, it just uh, brings that whole audience in, in a picture to me, um, the male and female complementing each other and in the Holy Family. Um, it was very special to me and I wanted to share that with you guys because mm. it's a beautiful picture and I can probably um, post it on, face, on the Facebook page if you guys are on that and so you can look at it in detail. Yeah. It's, it's just beautiful, it's amazing. 
That's yeah. awesome. The picture's worth a thousand yeah. words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the original? You have the original or is that a copy? Of That's the... just a copy. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. I love um, when people bring in art uh, to the theology of the body. Like we talked about music one day. Um, mm -hmm. And I love how the theology of the body Institute, like Bill Donahue and, and Christopher West always bring in art. Uh, mm -hmm. in their presentations to, sh to show the beauty um, of these teachings expressed in an artist's work. Yeah. So thank you yeah. for sharing that, Bernadette. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love art. I'm a big art person. And I love the Monday masterpieces and stuff that they do. So mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, we will get into Mary and Joseph a lot more. Um, later in the theology of the body um in the section on celibacy john paul ii speaks of <laughs> celibacy for the kingdom of heaven and he he brings up in that section the marriage of mary and joseph as being um an amazing example of both uh celibacy for the kingdom where they're both celibate they're both consecrated to god and they have this spiritual fruitfulness um, in their marriage. They're actually both celibate and married. So they have a completely unique situation um, in the fact that they're consecrated to God and they're married to each other. So in this amazing spiritual fruitfulness of their, of their marriage. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, but that's later on in Theology of the Body. Uh, <laughs> Well, this got very deep. I was just going to tell you a story that I, but it maybe will help. I once read, you were talking a little bit a while ago about how men need male role models in their lives. You know, and all, I think also women. And once I read a story, uh, I think a, psychi a psychiatrist wrote it. It's a true story about once in Africa, there was a herd of teenage elephants all male elephants doing terrible things, destroying villages and being like, um, being like a gang, yeah, thanks. <laughs> they were acting like a gang of teenagers. So one person who knew about elephants and, and about their development introduced a few old male elephants into the herd. And after some months, uh, some people found the herd again, the teenage herd of elephants walking orderly behind the older elephants. And uh, all the, the things they were destroying stopped, it stopped happening. No, they, they were behaving <laughs> mm -hmm. because, they had this, because they had these older elephants as models. And I think for me, it was very illustrating because uh, I'm, I was raising a teenage boy. I have only girls, four girls and one boy. And I know it was, I know it's very different I cannot treat them all the same and expect the same from all of them because I could see myself how different a boy's development is from my girl's development. And that's when I read that story and it made a lot of sense and it made me realize that, that guys, especially teenage guys, usually need these older men that they can try to relate to and that they can act as role models of course, always respecting this thing about, but we were also talking about about different personalities, right? And that's okay. I mean, that's, we don't need to be uniform. All girls the same and all boys the same. But, but it, it helped me, that story, because it taught me how important it is for boys and especially teenagers to have these male role models that are strong, but also disciplined, huh? not only destroying the villages as they were, but you know, respect, being respectful, being manly, but also respectful and taking care of others. I think Boys learn that from older men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, one point I wanted to bring it, that reminded me, Delia, of something Bill Donahue said in his video on this audience. Um, 
number eight, number, what are we on? Number nine. Um, and uh, he said that in speaking of this gender confusion in our culture today, um, that people are trying to be unique. They're trying to be a unique person by saying I'm a unique gender, that they're trying to express their uniqueness by naming it as a completely new, not male or female, but something else. And that's what makes me unique. But as Bill was explaining, there's only two genders, there's male or female. Um, but every single person is unique. Every single person is created by God, unique, unrepeatable, completely loved by God. Like that's a St. John Paul II says, expresses that thought um, that every human person, there's not a single person like you, like every single person is completely uh, unique. However, there are only two ways of being human, male and female. And so our culture is trying to express that uniqueness that, hey, I'm a, I'm a person too, by saying I'm a completely new gender, but that's just, it's just wrong. Um, it's not true. Nick, and I, I think both Bill and, um, and in the audience, that term person, even though we're into the male-female issue, when he talks about um, communio, he describes that not as male beside female or female beside male. That's person beside person. Mm -hmm. That's the humanity. That's love of humanity. It doesn't matter. A woman is not only told to love a man. A woman is told to love a woman. A man is told to love a man because it is communio. And we'll get to that when we get to the portions on community, right? Yeah, that's a good point that we can form a uh, community of persons with all like a religious community, like all female, you know, they, they form that community of persons too, right? In love. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Nick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would like to, uh, I want to respond that a little bit that like um, most of the, you know, the LGBT people always tell to people like they're unique, this is who I am. But like, if we look at it again, like those people are not unique, I say, because like they're completely same, like how they um, wear, how they, how they react. It's just like, you know, the same. And I don't see any uniqueness in that. <laughs> I, th I think you're you're right on with that Maurice I think though in many ways um, through some sort of experience of brokenness the uh, um, natural modeling or, or, or um, being drawn into their own um, gender has has uh, um, not taking place, and so they're mm -hmm. looking for something else, and that's why they they f might feel they're unique. But you're right; mm -hmm. it's just uh, um, following a, a different crowd in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The sad thing is is how much it seems that because of all the uh, popularity and attention that's going to um, the various types of genders or whatever, we're finding more and more high, or higher percentages of that taking place now. But it seems like uh, most of our problems in our culture originate from uh, how family life isn't being lived or, or uh, can be healed by how family life is lived. And none of us have perfect family life, and it, it's not totally prescriptive of uh, if your family life is less than perfect, this or that's going to go wrong for you. But I think overall, you can see how that plays out. Well, um, 
I think we're about out of time today. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for being here. And um, I'm going to close in prayer. You know, there's many, many more topics we could discuss. And, and even from the audiences in my presentations, I'm just drawing a few points. There's much more there. There's much more if you read the actual audience. Like, I'm not giving a completely... Um, thorough. I think you have to read the audiences yourselves to actually get the the fullness there. Um, but I appreciate the conversation we're having afterwards. And uh, so thank you all for being here. And let's let's end in prayer. Uh, would someone like to lead us today? Okay. I can if no one, no one writes. <laughs> okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord, for this conversation. Thank you for every person who was able to, to be here today to contribute in any way. Um, and thank you for all those who are able to watch or listen to this later on in YouTube or Facebook. And just, Lord, uh, we praise you. We thank you for how you've created us and and what you've revealed about um, the meaning of our bodies in scripture. Thank you for St. John Paul II. Uh, we say all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit.